For a guy who's in hiding in Hong Kong, Ed Snowden hasn't been totally inaccessible to the media. He granted an interview to the South China Morning Post this week, and he had this to say in that video interview with The Guardian's Glenn Greenwald. I think that the public is owed an explanation of the motivations behind the people who make these disclosures that are outside of the democratic model. When you are subverting the power of government, that, that's a fundamentally dangerous thing to democracy. And just about everyone on television, it seems, has a view about Snowden, his leaks from the NSA, and his motivation. I don't think uh, this Snowden character is a hero at all. Whistleblowers in general, we need them and they are heroes. I, I certainly don't think he's a hero. I have no doubt that he felt that he had the best intentions. And as far as him being a hero, yes, he's a hero. Did he break a law? Perhaps, but many heroes break laws. Glenn Greenwald has continued to work on the surveillance story and says more exclusives are coming. We've invited him back on Reliable Sources, and I spoke to him just a few moments ago from Rio de Janeiro. Glenn Greenwald, welcome. Good to be here, Howard. Welcome back, I should say. Uh, your source, Ed Snowden, on the cover of Time magazine. Lengthy profiles in this morning's Washington Post and New York Times. Commentators calling him a traitor or a hero. Are you surprised by how personal the coverage of Snowden has gotten? Unfortunately, I'm not. One of his big concerns with coming out, really his only one, is that he knows that political media loves to dramatize and personalize things. And he was concerned that the focus would distract away from the revelations about what our government is doing onto him personally. The other problem is, is that whenever there's a whistleblower, somebody who dissents from our political institutions, the favorite tactic is to try and demonize him and, and highlight what are his alleged bad personality traits. And that's one of the reasons why we wanted to present him in his own words to the world so that they could form their own impression before these smear campaigns began. Which you did in that video. And in fact, you write that there is a sustained demonization campaign against Ed Snowden. And you cite various columnists. But why is it a campaign for some commentators and writers to criticize what Snowden did with these NSA leaks? Others, of course, are defending him. I don't think there's any problem with people who want to criticize what he did on the merits, although I think it's extremely strange that people who call themselves journalists um, find more contemptible than almost anything when somebody steps forward and brings transparency to what the government is doing. That's supposed to be their jobs. That should be, they should be in the lead cheering for that, but so be it. If they decide that disclosure and transparency for the government are bad things, I think it's odd that they call themselves journalists, but they have every right to do that. What I'm really talking about is this effort to smear them personally. Um, remember, the first instinct of the Nixon administration when Daniel Ellsberg published the Pentagon Papers was to break into a psychoanalyst's office to get his psychosexual secrets. David Brooks writes a column depicting him as a loser and a loner. Richard Cohen in the Washington Post did the same thing. It's the tactic of the establishment to try and demean people's psyche and personality as a way of discrediting their revelations with the public and distracting attention away from it. And that's, I think, what you're seeing. Then that's what I think is illegitimate. You have also come under attack for your reporting in the last 10 days and since we had you on last week, for example, uh, in London's Telegraph, columnist named Willard Foxton writes this. Uh, he's trying to figure out why he doesn't like you and he says maybe it's the things that suggest he's a little odd, like self-searching his own name so he can pounce on people criticizing him. You can be a great activist or a great journalist, but not both. I think Mr. Greenwald should pick before something goes wrong. What do you make of that argument about you're blurring the lines between having a strong point of view and being a reporter, which you have been in this case. I think there's this mythology in journalism that has subsisted for too long and, and has really degraded uh, how journalism is perceived, which is that in order to be a, a quote unquote real journalist, you have to hide your political opinions or pretend that you have none. As human beings, we all have strong political opinions. And I've always personally believed that it's much more honest and it makes you much more credible to say explicitly what your opinions are rather than try and conceal them or hide them or, or have this conceit that you, you, you are free of them. Um, I think that our reporting stands on its own. We've published five stories now, um, all breaking news. Um, the only one about which there has been any questions raised, and I hope we can talk about those, and, and the, because they're illegitimate, is one of the stories, which is the prism story. All four of the other ones, um, everybody acknowledges are completely true that the U.S. is collecting phone records on every single American. All of those stories have been unquestioned. Um, and there's some ver a very good article, in fact, by the New York Times public editor uh, just today that says that journalism is changing and it's helping. Healthy, um, 
because of the fact that sources can now go to people who aren't at these huge institutions that conform to these old style rules that people view as discredited, that you can have strong opinions and, and crusade for transparency as I've done, uh, and yet still do very important journalism. And I think everyone acknowledges that these stories are that. That uh, column by Margaret Sullivan echoed some of what we talked about last week as to why Snowden came to you as opposed to a place like the New York Times, which had uh, delayed publication of that story about the Bush administration surveillance program back in 2004, 2005. Uh, but I want to turn to something else you've written this week. Actually, it's an interview you gave to the website Business Insider, where you, again, you're critical of the media in the way, or some in the media, I should say, the way uh, they have handled this. You write about liberal columnists. Quote, I'm not surprised at their reaction. I've been amazed and disappointed for a long time at how the most slavishly partisan media Democrats who pretended to care so much about these issues when doing so helped undermine George Bush are now the loudest apologists and cheerleaders for these very same policies. But uh, can't, why is it necessarily an example of hypocrisy uh, if somebody criticizes uh, what Edward Snowden did? He did, you know, he acknowledges that he broke the law in doing these leaks. Without and, and at the same time, have some ambivalence about the uh, about these surveillance programs. Well, remember, Howard, I, I first started writing about politics in late 2005, and I focused almost exclusively for the first year on the NSA scandal back then, which was revealed by the New York Times a year late, but better late than ever that the Bush administration was eavesdropping on Americans without the warrants required by law. And the way that I developed the platform was because what was that almost every progressive, liberal, democratic. Uh, blogger, media outlet, um, person with a platform would promote the work I was doing. I was using my expertise as a constitutional lawyer and my interest in these issues. And they were all cheering for the condemnations I was issuing. Um, there were all kinds of controversies just back, back then, exactly the same as the ones now. Alberto Gonzalez threatened to prosecute uh, the New York Times for publishing that story. Uh, there were calls for the source, uh, who, who turned out to be Thomas Tam, a mid-level Justice Department lawyer uh, to be prosecuted and uniformly, I bet you cannot go back and find a single liberal or progressive or democratic pundit back then taking Alberto Gonzalez's side or condemning the source who blew the whistle on that program. And they now have you completely think they flipped? switched gears so yeah. that, yeah, and you, you can even look at polling data and overwhelmingly Democrats opposed NSA surveillance programs back in 2006 and overwhelmingly they now favor them because it's a Democrat in power who's doing it rather than a Republican. Speaking of polling down, a number of polls show that uh, either a bare majority or plurality uh, agree with Edward Snowden's decision uh, to make this material public, but also majorities or pluralities uh, think that somebody who breaks the law in that fashion should be prosecuted. Let me ask you about the Washington Post. Bart Gelman, who reported on the Internet surveillance aspect of the story about the same time that you and The Guardian did, um, and he says that uh, Ed Snowden told him, Mark Gellman, that he could no longer have the story exclusively once the Washington Post wouldn't agree in advance to publish all the documents he was turning over. Were you aware that Snowden was dealing uh, with Bart Gellman at the same time that he was uh, dealing with you? I was. Um, and and what, what Mr. Snowden told me was that he thought it was a good thing to have another media outlet, especially one at the heart of official Washington, invested in these leaks, namely the Washington Post. Um, he told me that um, Bart Gellman was working on only one of the stories, which was the PRISM story, and that turned out to be true, and we were going to work on um, all the others, um, and if we wanted to, we could work on the PRISM story as well. But I think it is significant that the PRISM story in particular was published by Bart Gellman, a two-time Pulitzer Prize winner, and vetted by all the Washington Post editors, as well as um, the editors of The Guardian and, and me as well. And, and yeah, he, the, 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 the source did want the Washington Post involved in that part of the story. For, right. for the good PRISM reasons. story refers to the electronic snooping on emails, uh, Facebook postings and things like that. And there was some pushback right. because the tech companies involved said they hadn't fully cooperated. But uh, I think it turns out that they, their definition of what the government was doing and the government's, uh, what's shown in government documents turned out to be different. You, your point is that you reported both sides. Correct. Okay, let me briefly ask you before we go. You say that in the time that you've spent with Ed Snowden, you've gotten lots of documents from him, uh, classified documents that will be the basis of future stories. Are there things that you will hold back uh, because you might make a determination that it could harm national security? Yeah, I mean, there are things that we've already held back. He, he and, and in part, we're doing that because we want to honor his wishes. He didn't want us just dumping documents that would, for example, enable other countries to copy the massive surveillance scheme that the NSA is building and impose that on their own citizens. So we don't want to 
print blueprint guides for other countries and intelligence services as to how to replicate what the NSA is doing. We just want to inform the American people about what their government is doing so they can democratically decide if that's what they, they want. Right. Well, when we spoke last week, Lynn, I certainly didn't realize we would find out so quickly who your source was. And naturally, as I mentioned, that has become a big story as well as your own reporting. Lynn Ringwald, thanks very much for joining us this morning. Thanks for having me, Howard.